Carnegie Mellon University's Advanced Database Systems course is filmed in front of a live studio audience. Today's class is the beginning of the discussion of the, the lecture material throughout, throughout the semester, uh, and it's still sort of a high-level overview of, of, of OLAP databases, but the idea here is that we will set the foundation for all the various parts of the systems and the papers we're going to talk about, like how to build these individual components in a, in a modern system. And then obviously this is highly related to the projects everyone will be working on, which we'll discuss at the end. Um, so, but this, this sets the ground, this is sort of sets the context in which we will build all the, the things that we'll talk about throughout the semester. So um, I want to first talk about, again, the basic background of how we ended up with the, so what is cons the purveying architecture for uh, a modern OLAP system. We talk about some high-level choices and issues in this space. So, I started early, sorry. Uh, yeah. Sit wherever, yeah. Um, right, yeah, so the idea, again, the idea is that we want to sort of talk about what some historical systems look like, how we end up with what the, what people are, how bu people build these systems today. Uh, and then we'll talk about the high-level issues you have in, in building a, one of these systems. And then we'll finish off just sort of a quick overview of what a query goes through, or what happens when you actually execute a query uh, in, in one of these systems, okay? And again, this is, this is a, a grad level class, so stop me and ask questions as, as we go along, okay? All right, so if you recall from the intro class, we made this distinction between these operational databases or front-end databases or OLTB databases and these, these an analytical database systems, or OLAP, online analytical processing systems. And again, the distinction was in an OLTP system, that's really the thing that faces the outside world, uh, either humans or computers, like, you know, like a web interface or a REST interface, that's ingesting new information. Like you're getting new state, you're getting new changes, and you're you want to store that as quickly as possible. And then once you've sort of accumulated a bunch of this data, now you want to start extracting new information from it. Right? You want to extrapolate new knowledge, it allows you to make decisions or decide how to do certain things or provide justifications for whatever it is that you want, you want to achieve in your business, or your, your, your institution, your organization, whatever, right? So that's the goal we're trying to do this semester. We're trying to take a bunch of data we've accumulated and then run queries or run something on it to, to pull out new data that informs, uh, uh, informs us about what our database actually contains. And, you know, but ideally find trends that we didn't think of or as, as humans easily. So in the old days, people would run these sort of analytical workloads on what I call a monolithic database system, meaning a system that was, had all the components and all the, the subsystems to actually execute queries and store data was all built inside this, this one piece of software. You, you know, if you ever run like SQLite or like DuckDB or MySQL, Postgres, that's considered a monolithic system. For, for the embedded databases, less so because the, they don't have threading and so forth, but like, think of like Postgres. You, you install Postgres, you put it on your laptop, put it on your server, you start creating tables on it. Everything you need to do qu actually queries and store that data is inside of Postgres. Right? So you sort of think the, these monolithic uh, database systems uh, was how people were storing the, the data in the old days. Right? And we'll talk about what this means in, by centralized storage, but like a managed storage, basically the database system is completely in charge of what the bits are getting, what bits are getting lit, written down to disk, where they're going, and how to pull them back in. So the, the first sort of work I shouldn't say first, because there was, I mean, Teradata is from the 1970s, uh, sort of built in the space, but people started really paying attention to analytical uh, workloads in the early 90s, maybe late 80s. And, but the purveying architecture at the time for how people built database systems was, again, the classic database system architecture we talked about the intro class. Row store, pages on disk, it's a buffer pool, fetching things in, right? Because that's what they were building for operational workloads. Right, a row store is, is exactly what you want if you want to ingest data very quickly in, you know, whether, you know, in a transaction, transactional manner. But obviously, if you want analytics, that's going to suck because now if you're doing OLAP queries where you only read a subset of the data, you're fetching in the entire page, you're fetching in the entire row, and then there's going to be a bunch of data you don't actually need. So people realized that th these were kind of slow, uh, and so they started building what were called data cubes. And you sort of think of these as like... Uh, just like a materialized view, or pre-computer aggregation query, like a, like a root grind, group line and so forth, across a bunch of different dimensions, and you would, you would generate this, this, this array, more or less, 
store that in your database, and then any analytical query that came along, uh, you would then try to target that, that data cube because it's already done a bunch of computation for you. Uh, and you, know, you could store these things in, in, a, in a, an array manner that was better than, than a row store. Right? So these things were not automatic. A uh, an administrator had to specify, I want these uh, pre-computed cubes. Again, just like materialized views are regular views. Um, and then because materialized views are trying to, certainly at the time before, time the 90s and definitely still now, they're difficult to do incremental updates on. You had to have a human, say, manually refresh you know, like a, through like a SQL command to, to, to populate the data cube. So like you would do something like a cron job at night, you know, run the refresh to build the data cube. So these were introduced uh, in, as I said, in operational databases as a way to be able to, to handle faster analytic queries than what you would do over row-oriented row systems. So with the exception of Teradata, and this is the logo for SBase with Oracle bought in like, I think 2003 or so, like SQL Server, DB2, Sybase, Oracle, Informix, all these guys had their own sort of variation of data cubes. Teradata did as well, but Teradata was primarily a, uh, an OLAP system back in the day. One of the first ones, actually the first one. So basic idea is this. You have your OTB databases, your operational workloads, this is where you're getting new data, and then somebody wants to run some you know, uh, query like this, where they have a, a cube function in the group by clause, and then all you're just gonna do, again, is just do a sequential scan on each node, populate the cube for this, and then when this query shows up, uh, if you define this as a view, you would do the query on the cube. Right? Just again, think of like pre-computed aggregations. That's all, all it really was. So what really changed uh, and got us on the path towards wh where we're at today uh, was in the, t the, the mid to early-ish 2000s, where people started building these specialized database systems called data warehouses uh, that were specifically designed for analytical workloads. So even though a lot of these started off as forks of Postgres, uh, we can go through that a little bit, but like, even though they were mostly derived from, from row storage systems, they ripped out a lot of the, the storage internals, they ripped out of the execution engine, and replaced it with something that was targeting column-oriented uh, column data. So all of these, except for Data Allegro and Monet, are forks of Postgres. Par Excel is what Redshift is based on. So we'll cover the Redshift paper later on. Basically, Amazon bought a license to the source code uh, and then hacked it up a lot, and that became Redshift. Um, MonetDB was written from scratch out of, out of CWI. DuckDB is originally derived from MonetDB. There was a version of, of DuckDB before DuckDB called MonetDB Lite, and then they threw all that all away, and then they rewrote it, rewrote it as DuckDB. Um, Vertica was started by Stonebreaker and others uh, back at MIT and Brown. Uh, that's a fork of Postgres. Data Allegro was a hacked up, was, was middleware in front of uh, Ingress. Microsoft bought it for like, I think a couple hundred million, and they immediately threw it away because apparently it was garbage. Um, and then Teza was the early one. This was actually pretty cool. This is a version of Postgres that had an FPGA accelerator uh, to do uh, ac the accelerated sequential scans. Greenplum is still around today, pretty widely used. It's a forked version of Postgres. Anyway, so like, these were all s these monolithic systems where they were designed now to run in a little workloads in a and control the compliant storage layer of the system. Uh, and, they, uh, and they sort of use their own proprietary formats. And that'll make more sense, uh, especially in the next class. But basically, again, they were in charge of what the bits looked like on disk for the pages they were storing uh, for, for the data. The other thing to point out is that all of these uh, were all shared nothing systems. Right? Again, we'll cover that in a second. But again, they were assuming that every compute node uh, in, in your database cluster had, had, had disk, memory, and CPU, and each, each node was responsible for sorting some portion of, of the entire database. So the way you would use it, like, sort of like this, is again, you have your O2E databases, now you have your, your giant data warehouse, and the idea is that you want to get all your operational databases, all, all the data from here, back into your, to your single data warehouse, because now you have a single view or complete view of all the data across all your, of all your databases. And so the way you would do this is using uh, tools called you know, extract, transform, and load, or ETL tools, and you just sort of get the change data capture or periodically getting updates from the all to be databases, doing some amount of changes to them to clean up the data, like entity resolution, like if it's A Pavlo and Andy P, you could figure out that, that they refer to the same person. Right? All that sort of happens here, and then you load this now into your data warehouse. Right? But again, for this, because the, the, the data warehouse wants to have complete control of everything it's storing, you gotta set up the schema ahead of time. You gotta provision the hardware ahead of time. Everything has to be sort of set up before you start putting data into it. 
and it was a shared nothing system. So if you want to scale the capacity of the system, you have to add more nodes, and now you've got to start moving data around. And that's going to be one of the limitations uh, we'll see throughout the semester. So then we hit the 2010s. Late 2000s, early 2010s is when these things took off. Uh, we enter this new era that we're sort of in today of these shared disk engines. And the idea here is that instead of having the database system manage its own storage layer, we're going to offload that to some other piece of software, some other service. Right? And in the cloud setting, it's going to be an object store like S3. All right? And the idea here is that because we no longer have to be responsible for managing the storage of data, we can optimize uh, uh, you know, the, the compute layer as much as possible. We're still going to have proprietary data formats, meaning like if, you know, if you're using Snowflake, regular Snowflake was sort of the first ones in this space. Snowflake, when you store data into it, it's going to store it in the Snowflake format that only Snowflake understands. But it's going to store it in, in S3. Right? So that was the first generation of these systems. Like they're going to manage all the files themselves. The newer generation and what was in the paper that you guys read that sort of fall under this, this branding label or moniker of, of Lakehouse systems, the idea is that it looks just like a shared disk system before, but now instead of having always using a proprietary storage format and only allowing data to be added to the database by going through the database system, you allow anybody to write a bunch of files out on S3, tell the database system, the Lakehouse system, hey, here's my files, here's what's in them, and then now you can run queries on top of that, that data. Yes? So on each slide, you have all these different products and companies. Yes. I'm curious, um, what would you say they mostly compete on, or does it just supplement the existing stack that that company has? Why are there so many uh, options out there? Like what so his, his question is, I'm showing a bunch of these logos at the bottom here. Uh, why are there so many? What are they competing on? I mean, the reason why there's so many of them is because there's so much, so much money in databases, right? Like, that's, that's why there's a lot of this, you know, you know there's, there's Linux, and then what else, right? There's a lot of database systems, right? Um, so the, the key difference is going to be in, I think, some of these will be hosted services that you can only get through a certain cloud provider, like an Amazon Redshift. You can only get Amazon Redshift on, you know, on, on Amazon. With BigQuery, I think they, elect, they have called Omni something or other. You can now run BigQuery stuff on AWS and Azure and, and so forth. Uh, but like, for whatever reason, people start building database systems because they think they can do a better job than what already exists. And oftentimes, some of these projects are actually spin outs of larger tech companies that decided, oh, we want to build this stuff in house, and then it turns out to be useful, and then they convert it to an open source project and get people to use it outside of it. So Presto started at Facebook, uh, Pino started at LinkedIn, Trino is a fork of Presto, um, Druid, I forget, this came out of something as well. But like, for whatever reason, people start building you know, these various systems. And I would say at a high level, for the most part, as we'll see throughout the semester, uh, the high level, they're all going to be basically the same. The real difference is going to be the things that actually really matter in some cases is going to be the top layer, the front end, like what the user experience looks like and how good the query optimizer is. In my opinion, that's the part that really matters. All the stuff that we're going to talk about throughout the semester, it becomes almost commoditized or comes table stakes, everyone has it. So we still want to learn how, how to build it and, wh and why they do certain things and, and, and why they perform the way they perform. Like that part is still super important, especially if you want to work on the, the internals of these systems. But the, to the average user, it's really the, the top part that really matters. So another way to say is like, are there too many databases? Maybe, right? But like I said, there's still a lot of money that, you know, in, in the marketplace for this kind of stuff and people, uh, you know, you know, these things, these things don't die. You know, like Impala didn't really take off as much as like Snowflake did. They're still maintaining Impala, there's still people using Impala. Would I recommend anybody starting off using Impala? No, right? But it's still there. Yes? Yeah, so the question is, is, is what I'm describing here the same as a data lake? The term data lake basically meant is that like, okay, here's S3, anybody can store data in there, right? Uh, but then the, the lake house architecture, you know, we'll see in a second, it does have the ability to ingest data through this lake house and keep track of things, but also provides additional uh, like schema control and metadata stuff as well. So like the data lake, the, the idea was like, Okay, dump your three files in S3, and then whoever did that is also responsible for telling the catalog, here's my files. With the lake house architecture, it's supposed to be like a unified sort of front-end interface to the developer and say, okay, 
here's my new data, and then the lake house can put it where it wants it, or like you, know, you can tell it here's where it is, and it sort of keeps track of these things. So it's not to say you couldn't build, uh, ignoring the, the incremental updates, we'll talk about in a second. It's not that you couldn't do what a lake house does on, on, a, on a data lake. They're essentially the same thing. There's, there's more services to help you to keep track of what's going on. Or I was wondering, when you said shared disk, do you mean data lake? Or is that no, so a data lake would just be like, uh, his question is, when I say shared disk, do I mean data lake? I mean, shared disk would be the distinction between shared nothing. Right, that you have the separate compute and storage, and you rely on the object store to store your data. So, you could do that in some systems, uh, you know, before like Databricks is lake house stuff, right? But the idea is like, it, you, there's much more manual stuff you have to do. Like, if you just dump up files in S3, but nobody knows about them, then like the query, you can't run queries on them. But so that means you would have to update the files in S3 and then tell some catalog service, here's what my data is, so they can then run queries on that. Right, so it would be like a manual process. The lake house is trying to do, do all this sort of automatically for you. It's a marketing term in some sense, right? Like the data lake just means just like, okay, here's, one, here's S3, and put my files there. Right, but the, the important thing about this is though, like what, what this allows you to do because it's gonna be a data lake or an object store, like I don't have to go get approval from the DBA to say I want to store this data, and you got to spend time setting up the schema and figuring out what's going to be in there, and yada, and provisioning hardware. You just start uploading files, and then, you know, for better or worse, like that makes it easier to put data in there. But then now someone's got to figure out what's actually in there, right? So you're sort of pushing the burden of figuring out um, how to interpret the data and the contents later down the pipeline. And in some cases that's a good idea. Sometimes it's a bad idea. That's almost like a philosophical discussion. But the key thing here is that we, like, we're separating compute and storage by using a shared disk architecture. So if we go back to our sort of diagram before. Now we're at OLTP databases. They're going to send their, all their data to an object store. And maybe there's you know, a ETL thing or some kind of middleware here that's going to do some transformation before it puts it in there. Um, and then the, uh, we would maybe tell the, the catalog, here's the files that I just put in there, and here's their contents, or here's, what, here's the, maybe the schema that's in there. And then now, if I want to run queries, the query engine on the side doesn't, is not responsible for the storage anymore, so it has to go to the catalog and say, what data do I actually have, where, and where are the files located in S3. And then once I have that information, then I can run my queries on, on the object store. So in this semester, this box here is what we care about. This is the thing that we're, going to, we're actually going to design. Right? This is what we call an OLAP system. Whether it's a lake house system can, that it comes with additional stuff that Databricks wants to sell you, but this is the thing that we're, we're described conceptually and, and how to build, right? And this is the way people have been really building these systems for about 10, 10 years, well, 15 years maybe now. Uh, that started off with like Dremel at Google, and then Snowflake was the one that really commercialized it. Like this is the sort of I want to call it a classic architecture. And I realize that you guys are in the 20s, and I'm saying this 15 years ago. In, in, in the scope of databases, that's actually not a lot, not a lot, of, not a lot of time. Yes. Were we ever talking about like the transformation from the LTP uh, databases to like the um, OLAP databases? Like, is it timestamp or continuous updates? Yeah. The question is, are we were going to talk about like this, this. It's called change data capture. Like, how, how do we get the updates from this into this? We're not going to talk about that uh, specifically. Like, what the process to do that? Uh, I can point you to some previous lectures that in, we've had guest speakers talk about this. Um, we are going to care about like what the data is going to look like when it goes in there, and that's the next class, like Parquet and Orc files, right? Yes. Uh, so uh, just to follow up to that question, um, the the paper mentioned that the lakehouse architecture addresses the problem of stale data, and that it is uh, it is updated frequently in the object store. Yes. Next next class. Okay. Already sorry. Next slide. Yes. So her, her statement is like. All right, in the Lake House paper from the Databex guys, they talk about, oh, it's a big problem with these data lake systems is that you get stale data, right? Because again, we're getting continuous updates from the operational side of things. How do we integrate that into our, uh, you know, in, into our, our, our database so that we're always trying to look at the freshest data? And so what these data lake, or lake, lake house systems provide also is the ability to do transactional updates, you know, in, uh, creation, deletion, updates, insertions into uh, this database. And the way you basically do this is that it's the fracture mirror stuff we talked about last semester. You're just doing a log append to a file, here's all the latest changes, and then there's a background job that periodically takes that, coalesces it, combines it, removes out stale data, and then stores it now into 
parquet file example for you know in the case of data lake or um, in uh, whatever the delta lake thing from databricks they'll take that thing parquet file and then in, store that now into your your object store and then update the catalog say here's the latest version of it they also can keep track of if you make schema changes they keep track of those things for you right it's it's providing more as i said more infrastructure to make sure that the object store uh, is is can keep track of what's actually in it. So we're not going to talk about any of this this semester. Um, Delta Lake is one, one example of a system. I don't know whether the paper mentions Hootie and Iceberg. Hootie came out of Uber. Iceberg came out of Netflix. Um, Snowflake has their own sort of thing. Uh, that, I think they call them hybrid tables. They can do incremental updates, and they, they support Iceberg as well. This logo without a, um, without a name is actually Google Napa. Uh, they have a paper on this. Google doesn't like put names next to logos. It's really Amazon, too. Like, how, how's anybody going to know what this is, right? Um, so that, act, I would, in, their, in their defense, that's actually an internal system. But we, they, they're publicly talking about it now. Like, we're not going to talk about these things this semester because we really want to focus on how do we run those OLAP queries as fast as possible. And once we have that, then we can, you know, we can go beyond that and build the, you know, the, this Delta update stuff. Okay. So the, the paper you guys read, they make a bunch of different observations. She mentioned the one about the stale data. But I want to point out the, sort of the, the three things that we want to keep in the back of our minds as we go throughout the, the semester to understand and guide us on how we make decisions on, on building you know, a, a system. And again, even though beyond the semester, you may not go off and, and build data system internals, but these are the things you sort of think about when choosing maybe a, a, an OLAP system in whatever your next project is at a startup or wherever you go next after you graduate here. So the first thing to point out is that in a modern setting, uh, in, in modern organizations, people want to execute more than just SQL queries. Now I realize as someone who's like a SQL maximalist, where I think everything should be SQL, this seems like heresy to me, right? But I'm not naive. I know that people uh, you know, want to run PyTorch and TensorFlow and all these other ML workloads uh, that, aren't, you know, that you can't easily express in, in SQL. Now there's projects like PostgreSQL that gives you UDFs to make calls into PyTorch. But most people aren't, aren't writing that. Most people are, you know, are data scientists that are writing stuff in notebooks. And so the access patterns for ML workloads, for example, are going to look a lot different than OLAP queries or SQL queries. And we'll see this later in the semester when we talk about the, the networking protocols for, for, for database systems, that sometimes you want to do a bulk export of, of data without having to, you know, uh, you know, it was retrieving exactly as it exists in memory from the database system rather than having converted it to a result format that you can then read as if you're going through JDBC or ODBC, right? And so maybe you want to get things out of it in, the, in the Apache Arrow format, which we'll cover uh, throughout the semester. And, and, and that's relevant to the projects. So we'll design our system, the most of the parts of the system uh, at the sort of the planner level down, ML workloads are going to look a lot like you know, Python workloads that look a lot like SQL workloads. All of that's going to be the same. It's the front end part that I was saying before that, that we want to expose different APIs for how people want to get data and, and run queries. The other important thing is that, the, as I said already, that like because of these shared disk architectures, that it's no longer having the data system having rigid control of exactly what data is going into the database and how people can get data out of it. Because now it's just files in S3, and ignoring any governance or any security permissions of how people could get to those files. If it's just files in S3, then we don't always have to go through you know, the front end of the database system to, to do anything with, with our data. Right? But that doesn't mean we still, still don't want to track schemas and versions of those schemas and, and what files actually exist. And the catalog is a, is a pivotal thing that makes this all work. Um, but because now anybody can put things in S3 in theory, you, know, you don't have to go through that full uh, bureaucracy that I mentioned before. And the last one is that, as they point out, and just think of your own behavior on the internet, uh, most data is unstructured or semi-structured. So unstructured would be like an image or a video file, right? Just, I think most of the traffic on the internet is, is from YouTube or video, video, video files. Um, and then a lot of it is also going to look unstructured, or se sorry, semi-structured. So this would be something like JSON files or a combination of structured data, like you know, a, a tuple, but then there's some JSON portion or maybe raw text from a... Uh, from a log file, right? a lot of the data is going to come in, the, in this format. For unstructured data, we're not going to talk about anything about this this semester. Like that's taking like a transformer 
or some ML framework that then extracts information about what's in an image or in, or in a video file, right? But what then it spits out after you do that transformation is going to be structured, right? So there's, for SQL purposes, it's not much we can, we can, you know, that we can do for this. Um, for semi-structured, this is going to be a big issue that we have to care about. Like, because people are going to dump a bunch of JSON files in S3, uh, even if it's in a structured file format like, like a Parquet or ORC file, which we'll read about next class, then like, we still have to be able to make sense of it. And this is a good example where we'll see some systems, will, the, the different systems will do different tricks to make it work efficiently for this. Right? Snowflake, I think they assume that like, the data is always going to be there, so they, they generate columns for this. Databricks, I think they, they do parsing on the fly. Right? There's a bunch of different ways to handle that. We'll see that how we do that throughout the semester. So again, we want we want to design our system, keep keeping these things in the back of our mind, and we'll see throughout the semester how we do each of these. All right. The other interesting trend that has come out in the last decade is that we've gotten away from these monolithic database systems, where now people are building services or individual components that are separate from the, the full system. And it's basically the, how I've sort of laid out the project this semester, that in theory, these different services could be developed independently as long as they expose and maintain an API that the other services can understand and use uh, and is stable, then you could start you know, swapping these things in and out or not have to build the entire system from scratch. You could use some off-the-shelf tools to, uh, to, you know, to build a full-fledged database system. Again, everything in Postgres or everything in DuckDB is you know or, or SQLite is written by the, those developers, right? Ignoring third-party libraries for like you know SSL and things like that, right? That's obviously not what I'm talking about. But like the query optimizer, the catalog, the parser, all of that is is built by the, the system developers. But now what we can do instead is is in theory use some some again off-the-shelf tools and cobble them together and still make a uh, you know make a full-fledged full-featured database system. The challenge is going to be though obviously. You know, if, you know, basic software engineering principle, the more abstraction layers you put in place, the more efficient, inefficient the, the, the software will become. Right? Just because you, you know, there's, there's intimate knowledge about what the, you know, the system wants to do at any given level, and if you, don't le you know, if you don't expose that information up and down the, the, the layers of the software stack, you, know, you end up doing like, the lowest common denominator. Yes? Do we know how costly it is to like, add these like, like, separation layers between the different components as opposed to like, having a full the question is, do we know how costly it is to start using these, uh, these different services versus having everything bitten, written from scratch? No. I mean, I mean hard, to be study, hard to study, though, right? Like, it's like, hey, like, have two teams build like, a multi-million dollar right, project just to see whether one's better at the end? Like, this, um, I mean, some parts are super hard, too. Like, the query optimizer is the hardest part of the data system. Most people can't build that. And, and they do end up building it. The first version is... A, is, is is usually a bunch of heuristics, if and else statements. It's garbage. And so in the case of Query Optimizer, I know, again, we have a project going in this class. There's been two other attempts to build standalone services in Query Optimizers. Uh, there's, there's CalCite from LucidDB, uh, and then that's probably the most common one, and there's Orca from the Greenplum VMware people. But like, there, actually, there is a paper about the effort it took to get or Orca to work in MySQL. It apparently, it was a huge pain. Because there's assumptions about these things. I mean, this is the, my last comment here. That there's, there's a bunch of challenges in cobbling things, these things together. It's not just like, you know, here's, here's the HTTP protocol, and everyone, every web, web server speaks it, and it's easy to combine these things together. If you ever use like a REST API from any service, they're like, oh, they want the data this way, but this other one wants the other way. Like, it becomes a, a train wreck real quickly. Um, and so making these things actually talk to each other and actually making it fast is, 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 not, is non trivial. So we'll see how it goes uh, for the project this semester. Another important thing that we're going to cover, too, uh, is what the, the intermediate representation, the IR, looks like for the various parts of these systems that are talking to each other. Um, and so I'll show in the slide what next, ne next slide what I mean. But like, I've already sort of mentioned this in, in the project write-up. That like, OK, there's, the, there's, the, there's the, the, the query optimizer, and then it's going to generate a query that it hands off to the scheduler. OK, well, what is it actually handing? The scheduler needs to know what's actually inside the, 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 you know, the queries in order to make sense of what goes where. Right? So how do you actually represent that? And then now, like, how do you actually represent data? What are the, the data types across these things need to be synchronized? But again, if I'm using off-the-shelf components written by different projects and different teams, 
you know, they might have 32-bit ints one way, or, and then all ints might be 64 bits in the other one. Fixed point decimals is another challenge. Like, the, the, how they actually store the data itself can become, uh, can, can become jumbled up and, and, and difficult. We'll talk about file formats like next class, and then again, we'll talk about execution engines and execution, we'll talk a little about execution fabric, so think of like, you know, Apache, Ray, like that kind of stuff. We'll talk about that uh, later in the semester as well. But it's, you know, there's a, no, a bunch of these stuff, and people have talked about, hey, there's all these existing things, can I just cobble together, you know, a Java database using all this Java stuff? Uh, but none of them have really taken off. They've all, I think they've only been like toy exercises. And this paper here that, that I'm referring to was optional. This is from the, the Facebook guys, the Voltron people. Uh, basically, they're, they're arguing that this is how people should be building data systems today, that have these standalone components that interrupt. All right, so here's a high-level overview of what the internals of one of these OLAP systems look like, given the context that I just described. And essentially, it's going to mirror how we're sort of envisioning the projects are going to work out this semester. All right, so at the very top, you have some user. They're going to send a query, assuming it's SQL, to a front-end part of the system. Right? And this will have like a language parser, a SQL parser, that's going to convert the SQL query into a bunch of tokens that specify its form. And then now we're going to send this, this uh, intermediate representation of the SQL query to some planner. Right? And the planner is going to have a bunch of different parts. They have the binder that's going to be responsible for figuring out, like, you know, it refers to a, there's a token that refers to a table name. Does that table exist in my catalog? Uh, can I do some, some, some rewriting of the query to put it into a, a better canonical form? Um, and then I'll have an optimizer that could do a cost-based search using cost models that are derived from the data itself to help figure out what's the most optimal plan. And so for this part of the planner, we've got to talk to the catalog, right? Because we've got to say, okay, again, I have this token, it's table foo. Is this really a table? And what columns does it have? What's the data type? Where is this data actually being stored? Um, do I have any statistics about that data? that I can then feed into my, to my cost models. And then now I have, uh, I now have a, fi a physical plan that I can, I can actually execute in my system. I've got to hand that off to a scheduler, again, represent it in some intermediate form. And the scheduler can look at that and say, OK, well, you want to run this, this plan for this data. Let me go to the catalog and figure out where the data is actually located uh, physically or who's responsible in my cluster for actually executing that data. Um, and then I now dispatch it to an execution engine, ignoring how I you know, distribute the, the, data, the, the query out, who's responsible for me, making sure the compute nodes are always running, all that we can ignore. And then as, as I'm executing my query plans, uh, my operators, I may have requests to go get data from storage. And so I'd have an I.O. service that I would make requests to, and then that I.O. service is responsible for going out to storage. I'm not saying or defining what it is, Okay, assuming it's S3, assuming it's some distributed file system. Could be a local disk, doesn't matter. Um, and then it's going to go fetch this box and then hand it back up to the, the execution engine that could then compute whatever it is that it wants to compute. And then when, when I produce my final answer, then it goes all the way back up to the stack to, to, the, to the, the end user. There's other two things that are happening at the same time. Again, the catalog is super important. The execution engine, as it's scanning data, as someone asked on, on Slack, should my query planner actually be responsible for looking at the files and figuring out what's actually in them? No, right? Because then you have to have duplicate code, redundant code, to have the, the ability to scan data. The execution engine can just do this because an, you know, an analyze command in SQL is just a sequential scan. But then it can update the, uh, the result to the, to the catalog. Now, whether or not it goes through the scheduler or whatever, this, the coordinator sends this back over, it doesn't matter. But I'm just showing that, like, the execution can derive new information that isn't just for the query, it's actually for the, the contents of the files and go to the, go to the catalog. Yes? So shouldn't that be the job of the optimizer to know specifically what statistics to use to store? Sure, yes. Yeah, but, then but, who, but that's. Who's, that? like who's, running, who's writing that code to the execution? I mean, it's a, it's a command, right? Let's say, I, need, I, I have some files, I don't know what's in them. Schedule, go tell someone to do it for me. It's another query, and the query, but the query is coming from this, not from, from somebody at their desk. Yes? So what we're thinking of is um, putting this stack following stuff in the well, let's, let, Okay, let's, let's cover that after class. Yeah, okay. Other questions? All right, so again, same thing, I.O. service. How are we actually going to find out what files are in there? Again, you could have a command that goes through the front end and tell the catalog. Maybe the I.O. services could, could 
is seeing some stuff and can, can send it over. Right? Depends on the, on the implementation. But I was, again, the, just going back to the comment I said before, the thing that's responsible for actually knowing what's inside of the blocks that I'm getting from, from, from disk or my object store is going to be the execution engine. Because otherwise, you have a bunch of redundant code. You have people running some stuff to go, you know, a bunch of threads up here started reading data, and that can, may interfere with what's going on down here. All right, I, I, I'll double, I don't think we're reading any paper specific about the catalog. We'll see how, as we go through the semester, a bunch of people implement this. Like Snowflake uses a whole other uh, database system. They use Foundation DB to do this. Right? This is basically a whole other database system. And you, all, you want it to be transactional, you want it to be fail safe, you want it to be high performance. Right? This is a whole other problem in, in itself. And, and, you know, and I want to talk about how we do this first, again, before we do the lake house stuff to do updates on top of that. Because right? once you build that, this thing, then you can build that, that, that additional incremental update part. Okay. So let's talk about a high level. Okay, that's the context of the conception of what, what one of these systems look like. Well, what actually happens when I execute one of these queries? So for this semester, although we're going to be just, you know, the, the high level context of, of what the system we're describing is going to assume to be distributed. All right, Snowflake's distributed, Redshift is distributed, all of these systems that, that I'm showing, they're all scale out distributed database systems. But we want to walk before we run, so, we, so most of the papers, almost all the papers we're going to read, are really about single node execution. Because at a high level, distributed query execution is the same thing as, as, on a, as you would do on a single node. Right? Modern, modern CPUs have a bunch of cores, sometimes you have multiple sockets, and you have to care about NUMA regions, where the actual memory is being located for, for each socket. So all that is still going to be the same, just when you go distributed, there's a bit more extra work to say, okay, well now I need to send data from, from this node to another node. Well, that's no different than sending from you know, this CPU core to this CPU core. Right? It's obviously potentially slower uh, than going, going over the network, but at a high level, the, the key concepts I'll be describing uh, throughout the semester are the same on a single node as a distributed node, or a single node versus uh, multiple nodes. So the query plan is going to be ideally a DAG of physical operators. Uh, so some systems, and data fusion is one of them, it's actually not a DAG, it's a tree. And we'll see later in the semester, well, that's going to cause problems when we need to do uh, nested queries or subqueries, because you want to be able to rewrite or maybe reuse computation from one part of the query for another query. But if it's a tree, you can't do that. So ideally, we want things to be a DAG, and not all systems actually do that. And then the data system is going to look at the query plan, figure out what data it needs to access, or where it's coming into an operator, and where it, where it needs to go next. And so we're going to figure that out all ahead of time, uh, so that when you run the query, it knows exactly how to orchestrate and, and schedule things and where to send stuff. Right? So we'll see a little bit how we sprinkle some adaptivity in, in this process where we can make changes on the fly uh, to the query plan and how we move data or maybe scale things up and down based on what we see in the data. Because that's going to be a big theme throughout the semester. Again, in this, in, this, in this data lake or lake house world, or the object store world, you may not actually know the, what's actually in the, in the files because uh, you haven't done the scan on it yet. So your estimations might be wrong. So maybe you underestimate or overestimate different parts, and you want your system to adapt a little bit. Yes? Uh, if, a query can, if a query plan can't be a DAG, what else can it be? Tree. Oh. Postgres is a tree. Yes? What, what do you mean, like, but like, like, what does the tree look like? Like, where's the non? Like a, like a, like, so like, like, like a DAG, you could have one part go to another one. Yeah, a tree where you only, you only have one parent. Or a DAG, you can, like you can do some computation here for like a nested query, and then send it to two different parts of, of the tree, or the of the, of the of the query plan. Okay. So this again, this will be a, a high level overview of what is going to actually happen now in the execution engine with the I/O servers when we actually execute a query. So again, these are our worker nodes. They'll have local CPU, local memory, local disk. And then they're going to retrieve when the query starts. You know, think of the, the leaf nodes of the query plan, like sequential scans and so forth. That's going to go at what we're, we're going to call persistent data. And these are the underlying tuples that are in our, our tables, in our, in our database. Um, so again, whether this comes from the I.O. service uh, through local disks or from the object store, at this point, it doesn't matter. So all now the worker nodes are going to do some computation for our query plan, and they're going to produce intermediate results. So these intermediate results, are, again, are the, the artifacts that the operator generates that needs to go to the next stage of the query plan. 
and again, we talk about this throughout the semester, like, we'll assume that the, the, the unit of work for our worker nodes when we execute query is going to be a pipeline. And then we have to obviously stop at the pipeline breaker and then potentially distribute data around as needed. So the way we would distribute data around is one way to do is, is through shuffle nodes. Uh, and the idea here is that you just you hash whatever some partitioning key is on the data that you're scanning, that you're producing in your results, and then you distribute it across them to, to these shuffle nodes. Um, and then this is sort of, again, this is the, think of this as the pipeline breaker, and then now these shuffle nodes are responsible for distributing this data to the next stage of the query plan, the, the worker nodes. Right? So there's really no computation being done here. It's just basically in and out, like storing things as a key value pair in memory and then sending out to the worker nodes. I'm saying this is optional because most, or not all OLAP data systems do this. BigQuery and Dremel is probably the, the most famous one that does this. And Google does insane stuff. They actually have specialized hardware on these things to keep everything in memory and run this as fast as possible. Right? And it allows them to do uh, a bunch of tricks for scaling things in and out because now you have this pipeline breaker. You can go look and say, oh, I thought the data was going to be this size or this amount, but I actually have this amount. Do I need more nodes or less nodes? Should I change anything up in the query plan? Yes? And so this is like, a, a, as a pipeline breaker, a place where you can insert like, adaptability into your query plan? Yes, yeah, so the statement is, is this, as a pipeline breaker, is, is this a good, I don't say stop point, but like, it's a point in the query plan where you can say, OK, re, let me reassess what is coming into me, and do I want to change anything upstream? So, so Google does that here. Yes. So this idea, some of this idea comes from the MapReduce world. Right? They would have an explicit shuffle phase. But the difference is in, in the MapReduce world, if you're familiar, familiar, with, familiar with things like Hadoop, which you, I don't recommend using. You don't want to use that anymore. Uh, but like in that world, it was all batch-based, meaning like you had to accumulate all the intermediate results of the shuffle phase before you could start the next phase. In a modern OLAP system, you can use it in a streaming manner. So as the data arrives, you can start pushing it to, in a streaming fashion up to the, to the next worker nodes, start executing right away. So it's having this sort of long pause. The other thing to point out, too, for the simplicity of showing this in PowerPoint, uh, I have the same number of worker nodes as shuffle nodes. You don't need to do that. Like you can scale things up and down accordingly, right? Because sometimes the amount of intermediate data could be larger than your persistent data. And we'll see this later in the semester when you do uh, worst case optimal joins. That like you, the intermediate data balloons to be much much larger than the persistent data. Even the final result will be much smaller, but this thing can get quite large. And then now again we do the next phase. The, these worker nodes produce more intermediate results. And then we send this now to some final node to do some final coalescing or aggregation to produce the final result that we send back to the, uh, to the user. And so I'm not showing this here, but the thing that's, that's above all of this, keeping track of what's going on, what, you know, what workers are still alive, what stage they're, you know, they are in execution, how much data they're generating, uh, that's the scheduler and the coordinator all above this. Right? It's different than like the orchestrator in like Kubernetes, because Kubernetes is just like, seeing is the, is the pod still up. Doesn't actually know what's going on inside of it. That's, you know, you have to build that ourselves in our data sets, keep track of like, okay, what are you actually doing? Because Kubernetes, again, that doesn't, can't see inside your, the query. So I, you know, I've already sort of said this, but the distinction is between persi persistent data and immediate data. Persistent data is the source of record for our database. Uh, again, could be a bunch of files in S3, could be proprietary storage that the data system manages itself. Um, one key thing, though, is that the, all these modern systems, because you assume you're going to run on something like S3, uh, and S3 is immutable. I, mean, I can't store a file or an object in S3 and then go back and make in-place updates to particular bytes. If I want to do that, I've got to re overwrite the entire thing. And so that means they're all going to be using uh, sort of pen-only architectures for how they design uh, the, you know, the data encoded in storage formats. And that's sort of the thing I mentioned in the lake house before. Like, Log structured, a bunch of changes. I think it might just store it as JSON. Uh, and then they batch it together and then store it as Parquet because it's, it's one right out to the object store. For the animated data, again, these are short lived artifacts that we're going to generate uh, as we execute the query. Um, and because they are only really useful for the lifetime of the query itself, we don't have to worry about durability and fault tolerance in the same way we would with persistent data. Now, with persistent data, because we're, again, assuming we're running on an object store, they handle all that you know, fault tolerance and resiliency for us, which is, again, one less thing we have to worry about as we build a database system. But for, for the intermediate data, we're responsible for maintaining it. Ideally, we don't want to store it on, on S3 because that's slow and costs money. 
uh, so we'll try to keep this in, in local caches, either in memory or on disk. Um, but again, but, we, but if like a node goes down, I, you know, we, we, we can handle that. We don't have to wait and make sure like we store, you know, a, a gajillion copies of animated data, because who cares? When the query's over, we throw it away. There has been some research in maybe reusing intermediate results from one query to the next. Uh, no system, I, as I know, actually supports that, because if you want to do that, then you just define a materialized view, because it's, it's basically the same thing. Yes? When you say little to no correlation on the amount of like, persistent data that you give the operator, like, is there not like a strict upper bound on the amount of data you could generate from like, the data that you were given from persistent data? This question is, uh, I haven't got to yet, there's a comment here that says, uh, that there's no correlation between the amount of, of uh, intermediate data a query generates, there's no correlation between the size of the persistent data that they're reading in or the execution time. So this, this, this result comes from the, the Snowflake paper from uh, a few, two, or, two or three years ago, or last year, um, where they looked at all, their, all the queries that ever actually executed in Snowflake, and they saw that this wasn't the case at all, right? And so your statement is, oh, could there just be an upper bound uh, where I know the, the max limit of the amount of data I could ever generate? Well, no, right? Because I, I, my query, I can do anything. I can just do, you know, a loop a billion times and generate a bunch of random stuff. It costs you money. You'd be stupid to do it, but you could do it, right? And the challenge is going to be, again, for query optimization, is to know when this is going to happen. When, like, you have an operator that's going to generate uh, uh, more intermediate results than the data going into it. Because you want to use that to figure out, okay, what join algorithm should I use? Worst case, optimal or hash join. Again, I keep saying this. We'll cover it later this semester. I mean, hopefully, again, I, I, I remember when I, when I was you know, taking classes back in the day, like the professor would say a bunch of stuff in the beginning, like, what the hell is he talking about, right? And then later on, you see, oh, yeah, I, like, you learn all that stuff, and it clicks. So I'm bringing this stuff up now, because like, when we hit those lectures, like, oh, yeah, that's what he meant by this. Worst case, optimal joints. OK, now I know what that is. Right? So that, that's, it's a prelude for what's the common. And hopefully, you can see I'm getting excited, because uh, databases are awesome. Okay. Uh, so the, the, the other thing we have to consider now, too, in our system architecture is the way in which we're going to transfer data between the different operators of the, the nodes. Um, and it's really going to come down to where that persistent data is actually going to be stored. Uh, and again, the, the high-level detail is like, if it was a shared nothing system, which we'll cover in a second, you primarily use push query to the data in a uh, shared disk system. You would think it primarily would be, by textbook definition, pulling data to the query. But we'll see in a modern setting, these lines get blurred very quickly. Because for the intermediate results, you actually want to, you know, you, know, you, you push the query to the data sometimes. And in other cases, you want to, in, in some object storage, you can actually push the query to the data down to the, the actual object store. Other cases, you start moving things around. Like, it can get jumbled. So there's not really a clean divide between the different, different uh, models. But it's good to understand them in the context, again, of, of the system that we're trying to build conceptually in our minds. So the, the push approach, again, is that the idea is that the, the query itself, either the SQL string or the intermediate rep representation of the query plan, is going to be much smaller than the data. So why transfer a bunch of data over to the node just to execute it? Why not just send the query, which is much smaller, over to, to where the data is actually being stored? And I can do the processing there and, not, and then you know, send back the intermediate results, which ideally should be smaller than the persistent data. right? And so this made a lot of sense in the old days when uh, disks were super slow and networking was super slow, right? Uh, and, and usually the network is always considered much slower than the disk. That's not really that true anymore. Um, like Harvard's gotten really good. So the, the, the challenge in this space, though, is that you may not have the computational capabilities on wherever the data is actually being stored to do any processing on that side, right? Again, you think of like using S3. If you ignore the select operator, which we'll talk about in a second, like it's just the API is get, put, and delete. You can't say, oh, by the way, also execute this part of the query plan for me. You can. We'll, we'll talk about it in a second. Like that's usually what the API is exposed to. Actually, in, in Google, that's all they expose to you. So you can't do any computation there. So you can't push the query to the data. You instead have to pull the query to the data. Right? You bring the data that you need, do the processing there, uh, generate enemy results, and then send it to, to the next stage. All right? And again, this, the idea is, again, the size of the query relative to the size of the data that you're processing is going to be much smaller. The largest query I've ever heard of, in like pure, the pure SQL string itself, was 10 megabytes from Google. Right? 
that's a huge ass query, right? It's, it's big, but like it's the processing terabytes of data, like there's, there's, it's not even close, or turn, order of magnitude difference. So in the old days, this was considered the primary way to do it, especially in a shared nothing architecture. But in shared disk, you actually, if you just in ignoring the, the, the extra features you can get from object stores, you would do this. And so the extra features that I'm talking about are in things like S3, they have this select operator where now you can basically send what looks like a SQL query down to S3 when you make the get request. Uh, and you can say, here's run this filter on this data. And S3 actually knows the contents of what your objects actually look like. So it's not like a dumb key value store where you say, hey, here, give me this bucket. And I don't, just give me the byte stream, I don't care what's in it. Like, as they say here, they know that it's a CSV, a JSON, if it's parquet, and they actually can process that natively where the, uh, the data is actually being stored. I don't know whether, how they charge you for this, whether it's just the fetch command or like they charge you the runtime or because it runs as a lambda function. I actually have no idea. But again, this allows us to do predicate pushdown in a shared disk architecture, which we, again, according to the textbook, you, you would not be able to do. Uh, Microsoft has their own thing. I don't know whether you get SQL, but you can kind of see like the, you know, you, you pass in some kind of you know, query there. Uh, and it's, again, as far as I know, Google doesn't have this. So at least I, I didn't look this year, but last year they, they didn't have this as well. So again, this is what I'm saying. The lines get blurred because you can do some, some predicate pushdown and other things and, and projection pushdown as well. All right, again, hot, yes? This question is, do you always want to do predicate pushdown if the option is available? No, because like, it may be the case that the, the, the block of data you need is going to be used over and over again, but a bunch of queries that have different predicates. So therefore, I'm making now multiple requests to S3 to get different portions of that same file, whereas it would have been cheaper just to go get it once, cache it, then do all my filtering locally. Right? But how, how to figure that out? It's hard. right? And that's why people pay a lot of money for databases, because um, they'll, they'll, they can do that all for you. I actually don't know how many systems actually do that, this, this trick, though. I think Redshift does it, because they obviously built it. Uh, but I don't know whether Snowflake does it. All right, so again, share nothing architecture. This is what we covered in the intro class. You know, cl classic textbook definition. Actually, it came, comes from Stonebreaker. This is something that he coined in the in 1980s. And this was the prevailing architecture for, for distributed databases, both for OHP and OLAP systems for, you know, for 30 years until the, 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 the 2010s. Um, again, each, each node itself is going to have its own local CPU, locally attached to disk and, uh, and memory. And any time you want to send information to or get data from another node, you got to go over the network and send TCP or UDP requests. right? So we'll call you know, each of these things as a single data system node. So think of like EC2, you, know, you, get, a, you get an instance that we're, we're talking about that. The database is going to be partitioned into disjoint subsets across the nodes, right? Again, picking like a, uh, a partition key, you can do the range partitioning or hash partitioning to divide them all up evenly across the different nodes. Um, and then now since the data is being stored by the data system that's local, uh, then I can just use a POSIX API. You know, I can use syscalls to go get you know, fread or fopen and get the file, the data that I actually need. Because everything, again, it's just files on, on disk that I control my file system. Um, yes? When you add a new node, like, do you need to immediately move data or as more data comes in? Yeah, so his question is, if I add a new node, do I have to move data immediately or do I move data as it comes in? Uh, so this is going to be one of the big problems we're going to face in Share Nothing, is that if we want to increase capacity here, and I have to add a new node, but then that node, when it gets added, doesn't have any data in it. Can't you use NFS mounts? So he says, can't you use NSF, NFS mounts? Uh, but then, wait, NFS has to be like a central storage, right? It, it can't be, you can't do like a peer-to-peer -peer file system. Right? AFS, same thing, right? It's a, it's a central storage. So that's a shared disk architecture. The difference is going to be, though, is that in something like AFS or NFS, the the location or the, the, the distribution of the data physically is transparent to, to the database system because it's a POSIX API. You just call fopen and fread. You don't actually know underneath the covers where that data is actually being stored, right? So unless you now ex somehow explicitly tell NFS to like partition things a certain way, and so that when you, when you read this range versus that range, 
you know that you know only certain uh, pieces of data that you know get it locally. But, but again, it, it's it's as opaque storage as, that you don't understand. You can have a metadata service that tells you where the data is located, right? You can access. But through N, through NFS, like NFS doesn't expose you that expose that to no, you. No, but you can have a separate component that does, provides that. But then you got to get that, that, that information out of NFS. And now you're basically building a database system. Like, why bother? You? We don't like no data. You don't want to run your database on NFS, right? Um, it needs to be able to scale out like this. I'm not saying like people do that. People run the SANS all the time, uh, or distributed file systems. But like, we can do better. The data system can do better if it knows exactly where the, the data is actually. Maybe not physically stored because if it's S3, all that's abstracted away from you too as well. But like, it's how do I say this? The object store versus NFS would, would give you roughly the same interface, except that you would have better control of, what can you control? You have control of things of like geo-replicate or not, and NFS hides that from you. You get more metadata out of object stores. I guess like I'm aware of like architectures where they use maybe Cassandra as like a metadata layer that they try to figure out, hey, where is this particular data is located? That's the catalog. You're talking about the catalog, so statement is, Oh, there's some systems use use Cassandra as the metadata layer that keeps track of like where data is actually located. That's the catalog. Again, I mentioned Snowflake. They use Foundation DB, right? Uh, others, I, I'm, yeah, I can't think of anybody offhand that uses Cassandra for this uh, in databases. But yeah, like it's the same idea. But that, that's, a, that's a separate database system to keep track of the metadata. That's not this yet, right? Okay. So in the shared disk system, again the we have the separation between compute and storage. You have the compute layer. There's still a locally attached disk. That we, yes. Uh, just very different question about shared nothing. If one of the nodes goes down, do you just lose all access to whatever? Ah, uh, yeah. Thank you. Yes, yeah, I, I, I got sidetracked. Sorry. Her statement is: If one of the nodes goes down, do you lose access to, to that data? Yes. So therefore, you have to replicate it, right? And again, this was going back to saying before: It's now managed storage that the data system controls, and they're in charge of replication. And so they have to handle all that for you. In, a, in, a, in an S3 object store. They, Amazon handles that, or Google handles that. I, I don't know how they do it. They guarantee a certain amount of reliability, and you know, for our purposes, it's good enough. Yeah. So, like in this world, you have to manage it. And then the, and the question was, if I add another a new node or I take a node away, do I have to reshuffle data? Yes. And the data system has to do that. And you, have to, you want to do this in a transactional manner, on based on in your catalog, so that you avoid uh, you know false false negatives. Right. So in the shared disk system, again, we have the compute layer and we have the storage layer here, and we just access this through a, you know, some, some kind of API. And, and in, in the cloud world, uh, instead of using POSIX API, right, because there's not, you don't want to use like a fused file system to talk to S3, you instead use whatever the user space API that the cloud provider provides for you. Like Amazon gives you a bunch of libraries to, to talk to S3. Um, some data systems go to extremes and throw, all, throw that all away and rewrite it themselves. Uh, we'll see one in a second, but like that's how we're going we're to interact with these things. And so now, what the way to think about this is the the compute nodes are stateless. Like in my share in my share nothing system, going back, as she pointed out, like I partition my database, and now each node, ignoring replication, is responsible for that that partition of, of the data. And so if I want to take a node away, well, I got to copy whatever's in it and send it to all the other nodes to redistribute it. But in a, uh, in a shared disk system, if I want to take away one of these compute nodes, well, OK, that's fine, because the data is down here. So I could, in theory, kill this thing uh, and then not lose any data. Or I could turn, turn them all off, not pay for the compute costs, and then you know, all my data is still retained. Whereas in a shared nothing system, I've got to keep the CPUs running, because if, if they go away, then the data, data goes, goes away. Yeah, you can check point to EBS and all that, but like, yes? So like if we shut off the compute layer, we would lose like any IR stuff, the any utilization stuff that we're processing if we're like doing the query. So so his statement is uh, his statement is and he's correct that like if we shot if we shut off either in the share nothing or share disk, if I'm literally running querying at the time, then yes, there's a femoral state for that query that I would lose. Yes. And we can talk about how to, to handle fault tolerance, you know, later on for that. Um, but typically the way again, if say ignoring uh, unexpected failures. When you do a shutdown, you basically you, you announce to all the nodes, "Hey, I'm going to shut down. 
finish whatever jobs you're doing, and then once once the the last queries or you know, plan fragments leave the queue, then you can shut it down. Like there's there's a step, the process of doing that. It's not you know it's not, not no, nothing fancy. It's not hard. Okay. Um, again, we'll see this later in the semester, but like there'll be a catalog service that keeps track of um, of you know this data actually here is still going to be partitioned, even though it, we see. You know, this thing could just be a bunch of files in S3, and I could keep track of my catalog, which of my compute nodes is responsible for those files. And then if I increase or decrease my capacity, I have to run then some kind of uh, update to my catalog to say, okay, the, these new nodes are now responsible for this other technique. And then for that one, in case cases like Snowflake, they'll just use consistent hashing to avoid having to reshuffle everything. Right? That, that all the standard techniques still apply here. All right, so. This to, to, to finish up with this, the, the distinction, again, in the share nothing, it's hard to scale capacity. Potentially, it is faster because now everything's sort of local. Uh, but the, the, the engineering benefits and the operational benefits, benefits you get from something like a shared disk architecture is why basically every OLAP system built in the last 10 years uses this technique. And even systems that started off using share nothing, like yellow brick, uh, have, have converted to this. Because right, the, the benefits are, are so significant. And again, like Amazon's improving S3 all the time. So, so as they make those changes, your data rides along the wave and gets all those updates and new features as well. Right? Because when S3 first came out, it didn't have that select command. Now it does. So that's something you know, they've added that you, you can then take the benefit of without having to do any engineering for yourself. And S3 is pretty cheap. It's actually really cheap uh, compared to EBS and other things. It's not the fastest. But then that's okay. We're database people. We know how to do caching. It's basically a buffer pool manager, right? We know how to do caching to avoid that, those lo long latencies of doing disk access. So we can do all of that to hide the, 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 the slow late, the round trip times from something like S3. All right? So again, this semester we're going to focus on, on this implementation. So this is not a new idea. Again, I sort of showed like, oh, these things became vogue in the 2010s, but it actually goes back to the 1980s. And traditionally, these things were terrible, these shared disk database systems. Uh, but because of the cloud stores, because of all these, these you know, every, every vendor has their own version. Uh, there's local things like Ceph and other stuff, uh, or GlusterFS. Like there's, there's local object stores uh, you could use. Like these things are so prevalent that, every, again, every system is based on this. So just to give you an example of what a non-cloud version of a, a shared disk architecture would look like that's old, this is Oracle Exadata. So when you buy Oracle Exadata, it's, again, it's millions of dollars. They ship you a rack. Or a bunch of racks, and the, it's basically a shared disk architecture that's going over like InfiniMan or Fiber Channel from the compute nodes to the to the storage nodes, right? I think they can do predicate push down on, on the storage size as well. And again, this is all running in the same rack instead of like on the object store uh, over over the, the public network in in Amazon. Um, but again, just, just showing that these ideas have been around for a long time. All right, so let's talk about the object stores from again from the portion that we care about. So. Again, from the Davis's perspective, it's disk. And instead of going, again, we're not using POSIX API, we're not using the, the you know, uh, libc calls, we're using whatever the API the, the, the cloud vendor is providing us. Um, but we're going to be responsible for what we're actually storing in it. And then whether that's going to be in a proprietary format that's custom to the database system or a open source format that we'll cover next class, uh, it, 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 again, it doesn't matter. So most of the, you know, in most of these systems, they're going to be storing it in the PAX format. Again, think of that as like it's a columnar format, but the the tables can be divided up into to row groups or blocks, big blocks of data, and then within that block, all the data for a single tuple is going to be located in it, but it's just going to be stored in a columnar format. And that's different than like the really early column store systems, like in Vertica, for example. I think they stored the entire column as a separate contiguous file, and every column was its own file. In the PAX world, again, you, you, you combine things together so that all the tuples are spatially close to each other within the file, even though they're stored in a, in a columnar format. Again, we'll, and we'll cover this next class, but there'll be some kind of header or footer for every, all these files that's going to contain the, how to get to these offsets, because everything has to be fixed length to get to the different uh, tuples that you need, how things are being compressed, any additional sketches or indexes or metadata where we want to store for what the data is, which again, we scan through the execution engine and then feed that into the to the, the catalog so that the planner can use it. Again, all this will cover in the next class. And again, basically what happens is you retrieve either the, the header 
or in the case of parquet and orc, it's always at the footer because it's, it's, an, it's a, an append only uh, storage. So you, so you start writing up the file, and then you realize, OK, here's all the data I just stored. And you put that in the footer. So you can use your object store to go just retrieve the footer of the file and then figure out what's actually inside of it. Right? And like I said, they all have their own version of put, get, and delete. Um, so this is, the, this is the one system we're going to cover later in the semester, but I bring it up now because it's, like, it's wild what they did. So Yellow Brick was originally an on-prem database system that was shared nothing. It was an appliance. Like you'd, you'd buy these custom hardware uh, that they would put together that was tuned for the database system, and you'd, and you'd run this on-prem. They switched converted to a cloud-based database system, like a Snowflake or like a Redshift and others. Um, but they found that when they converted over to the to run in the public cloud, the, the, the object store was just so much slower than they were used to in their you know, on-prem version, the appliance version. So they end up rewriting a lot of things that Amazon provides you or, or like the operating system provides you, and everything's all custom. So for example, they threw away the Amazon libraries, wrote their own libraries to call S3 using Intel DBDK. So it's doing kernel bypass, which we'll cover later this semester, basically to do fast lookups to S3, get the contents or get the, get the data you need, and not make a copy in the kernel, just immediately pass it up to user space. DBDK is a nightmare. We'll cover that, why that's in later in the semester. Or like, instead of running over TCP, TCP IP, they, they wrote their own network protocol over UDP, because it was just so much faster for them. So they rewrote a ton of stuff, which didn't say. They wrote their own PCIe drivers. Like, who does that? Database people, right? It's awesome. So, um, you know, the, the, there is, like, even though I said S3 is slow or, you know, relative to local disk, there's ways to make it faster. And again, caching is also going to help us hide lo lo those long latencies as well, right? relying on the, the local attached disk on the compute nodes. OK, so to finish up, the, uh, today again, it was just it was a, uh, me vomiting a bunch of database stuff at you uh, to, as, a, as a preview for where we're going to go this semester. Uh, and we're basically going to start from, from the bottom layer. We're not going to talk about how S3 works. Because right, that part we don't really care about. But we're going to talk about what the data is actually going to look like in, that we're going to put in S3. And then we'll start building the layers on, on, on top of that or to be able to ex ex execute queries. And so the opposite direction of what, we, what I showed in the beginning, going top down, we're going to go bottom up. Um, and the idea really is about how to, what, what are the state of the art implementations, state of the art methods, techniques, and algorithms to do all the things that, that we laid out ahead of time. Right? And that's the papers that I picked for you guys are really designed to expose you to, here's a certain way of how people approach these problems. But then we'll also cover other papers that are related to the area or, or, or other techniques. OK? All right, so next class, the paper you guys have reading is actually something that, that I wrote with my former PhD student. Basically, it's a survey of the internals of Parquet and Orc. Um, it's going to talk a little bit about GPUs at the end. Uh, we're not going to cover GPUs or FPGAs this semester, although that, that's a whole other line of work. We're only going to be focused on how we do X2 queries on, on CPUs for now. OK? And then, so next, next class will be Parquet and Orc, the, the, the most widely used open source file formats. And then the following class next Monday will be, here's, here's, the, uh, here's new variations, new implementations of, of a file format that, that, that supposedly are better than Parquet and Orc. So it's like sort of the next generation file formats that are coming out. OK? Any other questions? Get a belt to get the 40 ounce bottle. Get a grip, take a sip, and you'll be picking up models. Ain't it no puzzle, I'll guzzle, cause I'm more man. I'm down in the 40 and my shorty's got sore cans. Stacks and six packs on the table. And I'm able to see St. Isles on the label. No shorts with the cloth, you know I got them. I take off the cap, but first I tap on the bottom. Throw my three in the freezer so I can kill it. Careful with the bottle, baby, you can still spill it. Cause St. Isles is said, the pain I red. You drink it down with the guys, it'll rise head. Take back the pack of duds. We go get you some St. Isles and drink it to the suds. Billy D is the chili cheese, so down with the weak guys. Be a man and get a can of St. Isles.